This video is going to look at patterns of natural selection, so kind of some other examples of how natural selection occurs. First, let's review the four principles of natural selection. First is variation, so not all of the individuals within a population are the same. Heritability, the traits can be passed down from one generation to the next, so all of those variations are genetic, or at least some of them are. Overpopulation, remember that's the idea that not everyone is going to survive, so some individuals survive, others do not. And then finally, reproductive advantage, the idea that the individuals that have traits that are more likely to help them survive and reproduce, pass on those traits to the next generation through genes, and that's how we get adaptations. As we know, natural selection alters phenotypes, alters the traits that we can see within organisms. Um, results in adaptations. There are three major types of selection if we're looking at how selection occurs. Um, stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. Stabilizing selection favors the norm, okay, the common, the average traits within a population. So we can see here in this graph, right, those individuals that are kind of in the middle of everything are the ones that have the advantage so there are selective pressures against the two extremes. Let's look at an example. Okay. So as an example, mice, they can come in a range of colors. And we can imagine that mice that are very dark colored or very light colored might be more visible to predators like owls and hawks, etc. So they're more likely to be eaten. So the genes that uh, for a dark fur, fur or light fur aren't getting passed on as much because those organisms, organisms are being consumed so maybe they're not reproducing so they don't have that whole survive and reproduce thing down whereas the mice that have better camouflage due to their fur color are more likely to survive and reproduce so we'll see the alleles for kind of our brownish fur color increase and alleles for dark and light fur color decrease. A second type of selection is directional selection. So this is when we're going one way or the other. So one extreme is favored over the other or vice versa. A great example of directional selection is insecticide resistance and antibiotic resistance. So let's look at how that happens. This example deals with insecticides. Okay, so pretend all of these little insects, they're color coded. Okay. Um, where pay attention to this red one. So an insecticide is sprayed on a plant, kills off most of them, but there are some survivors. Um, these are the ones that are probably less susceptible due to genetic variation to that insecticide. So they survive, they reproduce, and then in our next generation, now we have a lot more of these red insects that have, let's say, an allele that makes them more and more susceptible, or more and more likely to survive not susceptible. They are less susceptible to the pesticide. The yellow ones are probably more susceptible. Insecticide is sprayed again, kills off almost all of the yellow insects. There's only one left, but a lot of the red survive because they have that special allele. They reproduce. Now almost all of the insects are red. You spray the insecticide again. Boom. Now we have a population made up of only insecticide resistant insects. Okay. That's evolution through natural selection. This is why if you think about antibiotics and let's say you have receive amoxicillin, a course of amoxicillin that lasts for 14 days. And you might think after four or five days, I'm feeling pretty good. I don't need to take my antibiotic anymore. People do this a lot because they don't like taking medicine. But what happens is that the bacteria that haven't been killed off by that um, antibiotic yet now we're going to survive and reproduce, okay? which can increase the drug-resistant population. Whereas if you continue to take your antibiotic for the full course, you're more likely to kill off all of the bacteria within your body. A third type, disruptive selection. We don't see as much. This is when the extremes are favored and those individuals in the middle um, have selective pressures against them. So it's kind of the opposite of stabilizing selection. An example of this would be beetles that only eat kind of the seeds that are in the middle, intermediate-sized seeds. 
So plants that produce large seeds, those seeds are more likely to be able to grow into new plants that will again have large seeds. And plants with small seeds are more likely to reproduce and produce more plants with small seeds. So you'll see fewer of the plants with the intermediate or medium sized seeds. Whoa, did I get your attention with that? Now we're going to talk about sex. What does this have to do with anything? In addition to factors in the environment that can affect natural selection, there's sexual selection. So this is the um, kind of results in adaptations that help an individual reproduce and then pass on genes rather than just necessarily surviving. So earlier we thought about the example of the male peacock with these gigantic, really colorful feathers. Okay? Those aren't going to help that peacock's survival because it slows the peacock down, makes it more difficult for the peacock to run away from predators, um, certainly can't hide, not very good camouflage, and it takes a lot of energy to grow these huge feathers. So why bother? Because female peacocks are attracted to these really colorful feathers. So if the male peacock doesn't have a lot of eye spots, which are all these little things right here, these are eye spots, or really long feathers, he's less likely to reproduce. If he's not reproducing, he's not passing on the genes for these huge colorful feathers. So sexual selection is also really important. In addition to the environment and sex, there are other things that can change a gene pool or change the allelic frequency. And sometimes that's just due to chance. That's known as genetic drift. Okay. Two examples of genetic drift. First is the founder effect. This is when you take a really small sample of a population that somehow ends up in a separate location and then continues to repopulate um, that space. And that can mean that based on, so if you just take a random subset of a population, it might not be an accurate representation. Okay. Second example is the bottleneck effect. And this is when your population gets really, really low um, and then the number gets bigger again of that population. And again, depending on who survived randomly, it might change the overall genes in that population. A good example of the founder effect can be seen in certain Amish populations in the United States, where there is a um, group of individuals of who are all Amish who settled in an area, and it was a pretty small population that kind of stayed with them themselves for many generations. And in this population, we see a really um, much larger prevalence of polydactyly as a result of a rare genetic condition, much higher than we see in the rest of the population. A good example of the bottleneck effect is with cheetahs. The cheetah population dipped very, very low, and it has since gone back up, but there's not a lot of genetic variation within the cheetah population due to that bottleneck. Finally, I want to introduce two other terms which you may hear in relationship to evolution. The first is coevolution, and this is the idea that two very different species are kind of going through natural selection with one another. We get these symbiotic relationships. Oftentimes these result in mutualism. So we can see in this picture down here, we have an insect with a very, very, very long proboscis, and here's a flower, and what's down here, this is where the nectar would be. Okay. So these two organisms, we can see how they would be the natural selection or the evolution of one would affect the evolution of another because if this flower, if no insect can pollinate this flower, then it's not going to be able to reproduce. Likewise, if there's no flower that has a long enough, um, one of these parts, which name I can't remember right now, but that's okay, you don't need to know that. But if this insect can't find any food, it's not going to survive. So they very much are related to one another. And the last term I want to bring up, if you ever hear this, is convergent evolution. Okay? Converge means kind of come together, 
And this is not when two different species become one species. Do not think that. It's not that. It's just when species that don't have a recent common ancestor, so no recent common ancestor, but they end up developing similar characteristics um, because they may have similar roles in the environment, um, known as a niche, or they live in similar environments. Okay. Classic example would be um, birds and bats and you know, pteranodon, which are all very different animals, but they all have wings, okay? Or think another great example, sharks and dolphins. Sharks are fish, dolphins are mammals, but they have a lot of similarities due to the fact that they both are oceanic animals, they are predators, etc. So outer appearances, they might look kind of similar, but if you get down to looking at their structures and their anatomy and how they live and develop, they're very, very different.